One day I will put Paul Reed Smith in a headlock. Should it be facing my mouth more uh, or less? It's, or is it you know, this is, this is great. Really? Okay. Yes. Yeah. Pro? Yeah, pro. Feels very pro? pro. Very right. pro. It's very bright. Surprisingly pro. I actually haven't like done anything in this room for probably really like more one and a half months. Really? I so haven't recorded anything in there. So Isan was a month and a half. That ago. was that was the last thing I did. It. That's oh, wow. why this, this is still here. Right, right, right. Okay. So his spirit is still here. His spirit. His spirit. He sat in on. that chair. Really? Yeah. I can kind of smell him. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> Good to have you, yeah. man. Thanks for Amazing. having me. Appreciate oh, you dude, having it's me. It's gonna be great. Yeah. What's up, everyone, and welcome to Coffee with Ola. Today, I have the honor to have Mark Holcomb of Periphery here, straight out of the U.S. to the Swedish winters. Welcome. Thank you for having me, man. Yeah, thank you. It's been a long, uh, it's been a long couple of days trying to get here. We've had a lot of flight drama getting to Sweden, right. and I'm wearing the same clothes that I've been wearing for going on three and a half days now because it's been such a pain in the ass to right. get here. And Fin Air. You can bleep that if yeah, you don't no, want no, the airline. No, I'll, I'll, I'm, put them on don't, blast. I don't mind canceling or anything. All right, let's, let's put them on blast. Finn Air lost my suitcase, so mm -hmm. like I had to buy a toothbrush, toothpaste, freaking shampoo, conditioner, soap, and this is the only, basically the only set of clothes I have. Uh, since no, not now. Me. We kitted you out with merch, so. That's true. You, yes. get, you got me a hoodie. You got me uh, another shirt. But basically, like it's like what ten degrees, fifteen degrees Fahrenheit outside. So right. it's yeah, it's. Uh, it's not pleasant to have only this in Sweden in right. Swedish winter, but right. that's all good. Challenging. I mean, you were supposed to do a clinic here in Stockholm a couple right. days ago yeah. that unfortunately got canceled because right. of this. Yeah, I mean, our, our Euro tour kicks off here in, in two days, and mm. I was supposed to do that clinic, like you said, got canceled because all of my flights were canceled. Mm. Uh, and so, you know, made it here in one piece, thankfully, but yeah, missing miss, missing basically all of my clothes. Uh, well, I think every time you come here to play in the at least past 10 years, it's only been during the winter. Why, why is that? I don't know why that is, man. Like, that's a good... We have a lot more to offer than just snow and, <laughs> and gray shit on the ground, you know? <laughs> I, I don't know why that is. Come to think of it, I'm thinking back historically, the first time you and I ever met yes. was 2011, I think. It was 2011, 2012. We were here with Dream Theater. Yes. Here in Stockholm. And we met, and it was like, yeah, it was like negative... Fahrenheit. Like it was yeah, like negative right. five and negative. it was brutal. It was yeah. like traumatizing how cold it was. Uh, that was a big uh, gig for you too. That was uh, right. in the, uh, was in the Hovet, I think, or or was it the Globe? Might have been the Globe. It was, it was, the, it was where they play hockey. Yes. Well, they hockey. play hockey everywhere. Okay. Okay. So okay, it's, okay, okay. Well, yeah, it was a very big venue, I remember. And yeah. I went to the show and you know, we're opening up for Dream Fitter. And yeah. I remember I got, you know, I went to the, to the venue and, you know, met you guys for the first time. And I was like, you know, completely fresh in just meeting people yeah. at all, because that was like right when my channel kind of like started to yeah, grow yeah, yeah. and meeting, you know, these guys that you see online. I remember meeting Misha and it's like, you know, I'm, I think I'm a little bit nervous, Yeah. you know, yeah. and it's very weird. And that when you start like suddenly meet someone that we only seen on a screen before. Dude, we were in the same position. I mean, yeah. we were, you say you were green. We were really green back then. Yeah. Like we were in over our heads. I think that Stockholm show was only the second show of the tour. Right. And uh, it started in Finland and we played the second date here in Stockholm. And we had never played on a stage bigger than, you know, your average 300 person capacity yeah. venue ever. Mm -hmm. And all of a sudden the first show of the tour is in a fucking hockey arena. Yeah. You know, and you're playing to 12,000 Finnish people and, you know, instantly they hate you because they don't know who you are. You know, we only had a one record under our belt at the time right. and people just kind of wanted to hear Dream Theater. And it was a great experience to sort of learn how to, you know, adapt mm -hmm. our style and, and who we are as performers to a bigger stage. But uh, I remember being pretty terrified that first week just from the novelty of it all. Like, yeah. And then, yeah, and meeting people too. That was a that was a really golden age because there were people like you and people like Misha and yeah. like Ackle from Tesseract and John right. Brown from Monuments. Yes, and people who I followed religiously almost, and you know their music. I would I would just I, would, I was such a big fan yep. of or of your music of all of all of their 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 music as well. And then to meet them face to face was a real treat yeah you know and and have it just aside from only only facebook or back in that day myspace yes was a was a real novelty so yeah those, those were those were really good days i look back on very fondly that's 10 years ago man 
Dude, no, I mean, that's 12, that's almost 13 years ago now. Oh, if, shit, if yeah. we are thinking about 2011, that's, that's 13 years ago now, dude. That's and a crazy. lot has happened since. Yeah, it's wild. <laughs> it's wild, this stuff trips me up, man. Holy like to shit. be able to reflect on those years, it feels like way longer than 13 years ago in some respect, you know? But I feel it's not, really. Yeah. Yeah, I'm yeah. still there in, a, in, yeah, in yeah. an aspect. I still feel like a kid, you know? Yeah. Even though I'm Same. 42, which Same. is not kid age. Yeah. You know, back start hurting, and yeah, you, yeah. you get pain and shit. Like, it's like, yeah, what yeah. is this? But it's it's funny because I saw a picture the other day uh, from then and us. I'll see if I can find it and put it up. But like you said, we looked so green. I looked so fucking green, like a, uh, like a bird with the mouth open, like, <laughs> it's so, it's yeah, so yeah. funny. We've met several times after that and we hung at Nam, and uh, uh, you know, you you guys are always a pleasure to to meet Thanks, and it's, it's always very, it's very welcoming coming and just, you know, talking to you guys and uh, you're just really good people. So uh, it's a full pleasure to have you here. Uh, how many times have you played in Sweden? I think last time you played, I think I was out. Somewhere. Okay. So we haven't been here since Periphery 3, which was six years ago, right. seven years ago in that cycle. And we played at the same venue that we're playing at on uh, on Saturday. But yeah, we skipped it on P4. Yeah. So uh, yeah, I mean, to answer your question, I think this may be our fifth or sixth time yeah. in our history. And it's always fun, dude. Like a every time I see it on the routing, I have a soft spot for Sweden because a lot of my favorite bands of all time are mm -hmm. from this place, from this very city. So, uh, so I always look forward to it, man. I always yeah. circle on the calendar. It's like... Yeah, it's not cool. Is it the first headlining? Or did you headline the last one? No, we headlined the last time. Yeah. I think the only time we didn't headline here, playing here, was, was that Dream Theater show. Oh, okay. I think there was one show before with... Maybe you weren't in the band, but between The Buried and me. No, I was. You were in the that, band. Yeah, that was 2012. Okay, I was there. You were? Yeah, I was there. Okay. But I didn't know you guys. Yeah. You sure okay. that was 2012? That was 2012, between the Buried Me and the Safety Fire, if anybody yeah, remembers yeah, sure. a little band called Absolutely. Safety Fire. Yeah, so that was 2012. That, that was, was after? That was Three after. Three? That was like, that was the same year, I think, or maybe oh. a year after. We toured like dogs back then. Like, oh yeah, so yeah you so, have to. Yeah, I, back then I think we had to. Yeah. But now... Also during the winter, I think. <laughs> also during the winter, of course, yeah. because it's, uh, because we're idiots. Yeah, back then, I think we played Stockholm like six or seven months apart. Okay, yeah. And uh, that's pretty unprecedented for us now. We don't tour so much anymore. Yeah, it's a right. very selective thing. But yeah. back then, no, we just took any show off where we could get. Right. Yeah. So, uh, the latest album, Gent is not a genre. Yeah, it's not. No? I'm just kidding. <laughs> it, it very much is. <laughs> yeah, yeah. How's yeah. that been? Like, uh, yeah. I, I mean, what number album is it? It's like the fifth? Yeah, well, it's called Periphery 5, but I think it's it's our sixth. Seventh, if you count Clear, which I don't count right. Clear, which was yeah. more of an EP, but mm -hmm. uh, it's our, we, we numbered it five. Yeah, right. Yeah, yeah, but we're old folks now, I guess. Do you even start thinking about a, uh, another album at this point? Or like, how's, how's the whole... I mean, Dream Fitter, for instance, they have a very like uh, laid out schedule. Release an album, they tour, same places, Europe, yeah. US. Then it's, uh, it goes two years, then they release a new album. Same schedule over and over. How's your schedule? It's not the... that regimented. No. It's not that, you know, structured every time. For us, it's uh, it's very much ab about, so, okay, first of all, we, we always prefer to headline. Like that's just our bread and butter. Yeah. We have more fun that way. It's it's more of a treat to be able to play to our own fans, to have longer set lists, mm -hmm. to be able to do way more relaxing. If yeah, anything. For, for sure. And also if you want to do these really nerdy things, like the last US tour we did, we did this thing where we played two different set lists mm -hmm. across two different nights. Right. So no repeated songs. And uh, it was it was a blast. Mm -hmm. And you can't do that if you're supporting obviously. No. So we prefer headlining However, we, we do like to leave the door open for you know whatever support tour comes down the way. Right. So for this cycle, it started with um, with a tour we opened for this band called Under Oath in the states, um, and that was a lot of fun. And we headlined the U.S. and now we're here headlining Europe. But uh, it just it just depends, man. It, it depends on you know where we feel like hitting first. I, I think typically because the U.S. is our basically our original market, we're mm -hmm. an American band um, that tends to get our our, our first. Uh, I first crack at things, but uh, yeah, it really just depends. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Let's see. I think on that that tour that we were just talking about, Periphery 2. Yep. I think that was our first, I think Europe was our first tour since Periphery 2 was out. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. So I guess it just depends. There's no no real rhyme or reason to any of it. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Right. So the, uh, the actual writing process in yeah. terms of like, how do you guys 
like meet up. I mean, I guess in the beginning it was Misha only doing the like the athlete. Yeah. I mean, it's his baby, I guess, right. a little bit still. Yeah. But do you guys meet up and write, or how's that? Do you contribute songs, or do you write songs and then bring him? Yeah. To the studio, or like how? So now I can say, like, for the past three records, four records, maybe it's been purely collaborative. Yes. Meaning that, like, yeah, we all write our ideas on the side. Mm -hmm. Like, I, I always have a handful of ideas mm -hmm. I'm working on independently. Yeah. Um, I know Jake does as well. I know Misha yeah. as well. And then we all come together. And, and you then, poke into. Yes, and that's when the real songwriting yes. happens in Periphery. As soon as P1 came in, because, all right, for those of you who, you know, who are uninitiated, P1 was basically just, it was all of Misha's songs. The hits. That he were, yeah, the hits. Mm. Uh, From MySpace. Exactly, the, the MySpace <laughs> jams that were turned into Periphery songs, mm -hmm. but for all intents and purposes were Misha demos yes. that ended up becoming songs for Periphery 1. Anything after that has been an evolution. So two, which is when I joined the band, mm -hmm. Periphery 2, we would write songs in a room together, but we would still have this element where we would take old pre-existing demos, songs yep. like Have a Blast and yep. like Frog and Bullfish and whatever random the song. The Haunted Shores it. songs too, you already had. Yeah, so, so we brought Scarlet, yes, which was Scarlet, a right. full fleshed out song for Haunted Shores already. Um, Mile Zero, that mm -hmm. was originally supposed to be a Haunted Shores demo, I think. And there, there were some other songs which kind of were in pre-existing forms before they made the final cut for yep. Periphery. Everything after Periphery 2 has been, hey, let's get in a room, okay. hammer it out, and see what happens. Misha's role in the band is sort of this uh, producer extraordinaire. He's the sort of glue right. that binds everything together. I've always prided myself on being like, I'm not the most technically proficient guitar player, but I, I always like to be writing all the time yep. and noodling. And yep. I'm not, I, I've never been sort of trained or <laughs> to know what I'm doing right. uh, with a guitar in my hands, but I, I'm always outputting things. Yeah. Like I try to be creative every day. I try to make something every day. It's always awesome to have sort of, you know, Misha and Jake too, and Spencer, our singer, yeah. he's an amazing producer in his own right, being able to edit out these ideas mm -hmm. and, you know, say, hey, let's keep this, but let's maybe try tweaking that and let's keep this. And you know, it's always really invaluable to have that right. voice in the room. When I can't be that own voice for myself, no. you know. Do you find trouble when you poke too much into each other's songs, or? No, I mean, or okay. is it, yeah. But I, I mean, like, I can understand in the beginning, because I was exactly like this. Mm. I'm, I'm writing songs by myself, but like in The Haunted, we started poking in each other's songs, and in the beginning, yeah. it was really hard for me yeah. to do this. Yeah. Like, or have someone else, oh, can you do this in your song? I'm like, but whenever we got that to work, the dynamics are just way better, right. and it make, creates a better song. Right. I, I mean, I have the same exact account of it because yeah. early on when we tried to collaborate, mm. it was pretty clunky, pretty messy in the beginning because, yeah, having your ego stepped on and, and being told that, hey, like this thing that you worked on for several weeks, yeah. I don't really like it. Yeah. So I'm not going to work on it like that. Never. That, that never doesn't suck. Yeah. It always yeah. feels bad. However, for us, the turning point came when, when, when one, we started to learn how to address each other in those yeah. situations. Like, first of all, golden rule, never tell anybody that their part sucks. Like, yeah. or, you know, or that sounds like shit. Or, you know, it's all common mm -hmm. sense stuff, but things that maybe we don't realize is common sense, but have more constructive words. Yes. Just say that, you know, I'm not feeling that. Or yeah. maybe let's try and just leave that to the side. There's, there's millions of of adult ways to say those kinds of right. things without telling you that something sucks. Being receptive to it is just a matter of respecting those who you're working yeah. with, you know? And and again, you know, going back to the early days of Periphery or The Haunted mm -hmm. or whoever, it's like, I'm sure in your situation, there's also this mutual respect and admiration. It's not some kid on the internet telling no, you that no, your no. part sucks. It's this human being who you trust, who you share you know, songs with, you yeah. share freaking money with, if, right. you, if you know, if you're in the band. And it's something that took us multiple records to learn how to get down. But now, dude, I mean, my favorite songs are ideas that started with one or two elements that maybe yep. I put forward or Misha or Jake put yep. forward. And that got completely bastardized by the opinions or voices of other people in right. the room that started nothing like what they sound like in the end. Yeah. Those are always my favorite songs and I don't know if I'm biased because I was there for the creative process. I don't know, the, the, like the song like Blood Eagle off our last yeah. record started with a really stupid riff that was almost a joke. And then we uh, we tweaked it into what ended up becoming the main riff in the song. So it's just these really roundabout ways of making these kind of you know joke parts sound like something original and, and 
you know, something that pops to our ears, you know? Right. Yeah. Well, in my opinion, like I said, like the, the most dynamic songs are the ones that are poked into. Right. And, you know, when you're alone, it might, you know, no one's telling you what to do. You're like, oh, yep. this is great. Yeah. But maybe you need a producer or someone to, you know, oh, maybe this part, you know. Yeah. Or <laughs> do this and this, you know. I've always had great admiration for guys like Devin Townsend and like Isan yes. yeah. and... You know, I don't know if you want to throw Michael from Opeth in that category, Absolutely. but like guys who can just single-handedly, one-man show, spit something out mm -hmm. that sounds like it's been poked into. Yeah. You know, but hasn't because no. it's just one dude doing all the writing. I, 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 it's always been so alien to me. It's something that I marvel at, honestly. In Periphery, that's just not the way we've really done things since right. Periphery 1. Mm -hmm. And again, it's why I have this great reverence for Periphery 1 because I know Misha talks a bunch of shit on that record, and it's it, in my mind, it doesn't really represent who Periphery has been no. for 14 years, but I look back on, and like we're playing Letter Experiment mm -hmm. on this tour, and we were playing Insomnia on the last tour, and Face Palm, or sorry, that's off Periphery too. But like these old songs that I still love, mm -hmm. because they have this sort of, this like this one-man showness to them yep. that like I, I think is, uh, that's hard to put into words why I appreciate it so much, but. I think if you ask if you ask you know Misha, he has a far lesser opinion right. of those songs than, than someone like I do or the other band members do. Like you said, the first album, it's very particular, and when it came out, I was like, okay, they took the songs and put it together. You know, that's cool. That's a good album. Yeah. But when you drop the second album, I really felt like, holy shit. Okay, these guys mean like serious business. This is really good. This that's, time it was personal. Yeah, it yeah, was, exactly. exactly. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, but um, no, that's still my favorite album because of this, because mm. it really elevated you guys from, okay, you just didn't cut and paste song, you know, old yeah. stuff and material, and you just can, you know, raise the bar like thank, so much. Yeah, well, thank you, man. Um, but also, like, so when we started supporting Periphery 2, I noticed this phenomenon that I didn't expect, this almost uh, skepticism this like discerning eye from people where they would look at us as the, like the MySpace band. Yes. Right? Yeah. Like the no, internet. I, I, I confess, I probably did the same. Yeah. I think you had no choice to because most bands that came out of that scene and that circle, circa late 2000s, you almost had to think of it that way yeah. because very tested online, very tested in terms of whatever, mm. MySpace play counts or analytics mm. or whatever. And then you see their name on a marquee or, or on a bill or on a concert, your first instinct is to be like, oh, damn, it's the YouTube band yep. or it's the MySpace yep. band or it's yep. the Facebook band. And I didn't expect it, but we actually got a good amount of detractors and a good amount of hate back in that day from people who wanted to hate us yeah. because we were the MySpace band. Right. And I didn't expect that. I was like, hey, man, like we're just out here doing our jobs. Yeah. Like, we just want to have fun. And Sorry for releasing a really fucking good album. <laughs> <laughs> <You know? laughs> yeah, I mean, sorry for having a MySpace page like every other band on the planet did at that yeah. time. But it, it was cool. I remember the feeling of slowly you know, winning over those kinds of... Yep. Like those voices soon dissipated yes. and started to become... Um, you know, feelings of support and things like that when people realize like, oh shit, we're not just a, a bedroom band who, you know, sits and plays guitars, mm -hmm. um, you know, wearing PJs and socks. By the way, we were supposed to wear not, we were supposed yeah. to wear only socks. Today. We were talking we were about not wearing shoes. Yeah. Should we take them off? Are you like, you Can haven't showered, are you okay? I mean, you be the judge of that. Um, should we, feel, should we take off our shoes in slow yeah, motion to make the feet fetish people happy? I can slow it down. Get them off. What, what were we talking about? Um, um, yeah, the voices started, well. Yeah, yeah, it's like I started hearing less of that yeah. because it was, just a, it was just a simple matter of getting in front of people, mm -hmm. you know? And I still think now in 2024, there's, it's, it's wonderful because there's so many ridiculous artists out there yeah. who I know from YouTube yes. and from, you yes. know, online platforms that I wouldn't otherwise know but there's something that happens once you graduate from that and you start getting in front of people. Yeah. And you know very mm -hmm. well, because you and I have had very similar journeys, yes. that there's a, another level reached. Absolutely. That, yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's almost like you, at that time, you had to prove yourself yeah. being, okay, he's legit. Yeah. Or like, you know, okay, he's in a real band or whatever. Yeah. And, you know, I think that's tough for a lot of social media bands, is, you know, the, getting the feeling that they're legitimate. 
right, right, enough right. to tour or to right. be a real band or right. whatever. And legitimate, completely in quotation marks because, Absolutely. yeah, I have the utmost respect. In fact, some of my favorite guitar players are guys who I've never seen live. Yeah. Um, who I don't, like, if I never saw live, I wouldn't be that destroyed uh, destroyed over. But, yeah, there's like some, there's some, I don't know if it's like an old school mentality. Mm -hmm. I felt like it was when we were coming up. It was always the older crowd who'd be like, yeah, but can you do it live? Right. You know? Right. And then we, tr we tried. Name an a online guitar player that you love. Ooh, oh my God. Okay, so I just followed this guy, Matteo Mancuso. Okay, yeah, yeah. Am I saying it right? Yes. Okay. Rick Beato had him on a show just now. Okay. He plays with his fingers, right? I, I saw that bit. Yeah, I saw, yeah, and I, I, I only discovered this guy like a week, a week and a half dude, ago. Dude, he, he blew up completely really? in the past two weeks. I never heard of a guy. Really? And now two weeks ago, you see him everywhere. Wow. It's incredible. Wow. And so, he's amazing. So I'm not the only one who just discovered this no, guy. No, no, okay, no. Okay, same, okay. same, okay. man. Yeah, it's incredible. I always say that, like, I think the best guitar player I've ever heard in my life is Guthrie Govan. Yep. Still, just mm -hmm. like in every way. Yeah. But there's something going on with this guy. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So again, like, I, I just discovered this guy, and I've only ever seen him play, you know, that, on YouTube. That's what I feel like, even though it's really tough on social media to kind of get out there because there's, you know, it's just so saturated with competition and all mm -hmm. that. I still think like the absolute talent will spark through yeah. just like this guy, you know, yeah, yeah. he will get through yeah. and, you know, out of the big crowd and all that. And he, yeah. he will make a name for himself yeah, yeah. because he's just so talented. Yeah. So there's still room for talent and yeah. not only the, you know, just to bring out the content, like, yeah. like what I do, it's just like yeah, yeah. This <laughs> saturated with content just to have something. Dude, you have your guitars. I asked you to bring your guitars because I always forget to ask guitar players to bring their guitars, and uh, you don't have to worry about that because I these are these are basically extensions of me. So I bring them everywhere. And these are your three guitars that you you saw them live. Yeah, on this tour, um, I'm, I'm rolling commando, as we say. Um, I don't have a backup. I didn't bring a backup, so if I break a string on stage, I'm gonna have to pull a, a BB King and play play heavy riffs while I restring. So I actually and sing don't know. At yeah, the same time. and sing at the yep. same time, even though I don't <laughs> sing in the band, just like start <laughs> muttering Yoko Ono style. Um, have you ever seen that video of yes, Yoko Ono? Yeah. <laughs> Chuck Berry? Yeah, it's He's amazing. Like... <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, this is my eight. This is, I was telling you earlier, this is kind of a rare bird in itself. Um, you said there were only like 18 made or? I believe it's in that neighborhood. So initially, Tosin Abasi and myself were the first two to get eight strings from PRS. Yeah and they did a limited run of my signature model in eight string form mm -hmm. um, in, I wanna say 2013 or 2014, but that was limited, limited only to, I think 12 or 15 pieces. Right. And it was like dentist prices, if you know what I mean. Right, it lawyer prices. Lawyer prices, mm -hmm. other rich profession prices. But is there an SC model of this or? No. No. No, this is the, yeah, the only ones that exist out there in the world okay. are, are, are Maryland made. They're passive pickups, active mount, um, Seymour Duncan, uh, Scarlet Scourges. You have in to plug here. it in. Where did I put the cable? Uh, is it? Is it not it's here? Over here, yeah. It's well, yeah. so metallic sounding. Yeah, but yeah. Stringy. Very stringy. Yes. So that's one thing that I've discovered. I was telling you this earlier that like we experimented with making these pickups a little quieter than the Alpha Omegas were, um, and sort of making sure that a lot of these split these sort of split settings. Mm -hmm. Sounded punchy and stringy, you know? Um, the more and more I play live, I find myself switching just impulsively to a split setting. Okay. Just, and, and I think I've, I've learned this from Animals as Leaders because there's so many parts yeah. where like none of the guitars are on a bridge setting. It's no. just all these split coil yes. mid gain settings, and, uh, and it's I love that. It's a very particular sound. Like, yeah. it, and they definitely kind of yeah. you know, nailed that. Yeah, yeah. Those yeah. leaders. But yeah, I mean, on a bridge setting, it's just the most. Pretty pissed off sounding, right? It's fucking gnarly. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, this thing's a beast. How many songs do you play with a eight string? Yeah, like maybe 
seven, eight, or nine, something yeah. like that. I've lost track at this point. But yeah, it's a definitely our novelty instrument. It, we, it's right. not our bread and butter. No. Um, although we were saying it'd be cool for Periphery Six to have more eight-string stuff, right? Because it is fun. Yeah. A lot of our notier songs are on sixes and seven strings. Right. And a lot of the more sort of like caveman low IQ. Um, <laughs> yeah. yeah. Ignorance. Well, that's, it should be like that. <laughs> keep it low IQ. Yeah. Um, do you keep the bass the same tuning? Uh, on the lowest? So, or do you actually drop it one we, octave lower? Or? On eight strings, we just keep everything standard. So, okay. yeah, that's the only time we ever do anything. The rest are dropped. Missionary. Then. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. Nice. What do you call the drop then? Yeah. Oh, wait, what's that? What do you call the drop then? So, what's, what's reverse cowgirl. No. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, the drop. Dude, I mean, so you know the ex exact amount of stupid tunings that we use. Yep, yep. It's so bad. It's so bad. Have you tried and like truncated the tunings or? No, no. I mean, so there's there, there's one thing that works against that idea. Yeah. One of my ways to break out of ruts and to stay creative at home, like mm -hmm. I was saying earlier, I try and write every day if I can or every other day. And sometimes I just don't want to mm -hmm. or I'm feeling, you know, blah, I'm feeling yeah. uninspired. Um, one of the ways I counter that is I just try to throw my guitar in a random tuning. Yeah. And Misha and Jake hate that yeah. because, you know, I'll bring a song to the table like Wax Wings is off our last record, is a song off our last record that is in a weird tuning um, that I got from a Japanese band called Toe. They're like a like an indie rock band, instrumental, mm -hmm. and I don't even know the name of the tuning. It's like a, it's like an open seventh chord, I think. Okay. Um, but it was a really inspiring tuning. It's sort of a one trick pony yeah. tuning, right? Like you can't really write anything too heavy in it, but it's really inspiring and it ignited this song and it, it came out to be a, a, a pretty pretty cool song in my opinion, but we gotta travel with one extra guitar yeah. just to play exactly. this stupid fucking song. <laughs> what are you guys using live? Are you still on Axe FX or Quad or? Uh, Axe FX 3s. We just finished our first tour with 3s, with Axe FX 3s. We, oh, okay. were, we were using the two XL Pluses uh, right. for about 30 years. Do you use yeah. one each or? We each have our own. Yeah, okay. yeah we each have our own. but. Uh, yeah, I mean, I'm excited for you to see the show because you can give me your honest feedback on our tones, but we dialed everything in really, really specific. And cool. we spent, I mean, our last tour, we rehearsed for a full week, which is unheard of for Periphery right. because we, we just don't, we don't rehearse very much. And it's kind of a, one of my grievances about us. Mm -hmm. I wish we rehearsed a little bit more, but we spent a whole week dialing in everything right. uh, to make sure that it sort of was a level up uh, mm -hmm. for improving the sound in our band. And yeah, Jake, our other guitar player, he spent a month dialing in basically all of our tones right. and sharing them with Misha and I. So uh, so yeah, he, Jake's really awesome when it comes to that stuff. But uh, yeah, I mean, I wanna, I wanna hear your opinion of it cool. for the first show. You can tell me it sucks. If it sucks, you can tell I me. I doubt it, it will suck. Yeah, Come yeah. on. <laughs> you, you guys know what you're doing. <laughs> this particular one is not, uh, you can't go buy this guitar. Unfortunately, no. I, I, one day I will put Paul Reed Smith in a headlock. No, one time, I, one of these days, I'll put him in a full Nelson and ask him kindly right. um, to make these production model. But I, I, yeah, I, I don't know. First of all, I don't know how many PRS players out there would, would like an eight string. So if you want a PRS eight string, maybe it, it helps to have I have to tell you, I see, not the eight string, but the other guitars I see a lot of out there. Yeah. So I must say, you really, like, congratulations. I see them a Thank lot. Thank you, man. Thank you. Yeah, I've, that's been shocking to me. It's like, and that was one of the reasons why I thought it would be such an exciting sort of um, pairing, you know, back 11, 12 years ago when I started working with PRS is like, I... I knew that Opeth played PRS's. Opeth is like my top three favorite bands of yep. all time. And I saw them playing PRS on like Blackwater Park or mm -hmm. Still Life or something. Instantly I was like, that is cool. Yeah. Like seeing a metal band play these really, you know, classy instruments. I think PRS has that reputation, mm -hmm. right? And then making them sound pretty damn heavy. So I was, I was excited at the proposition at first of making these, you know, very unabashedly metal yep. instruments. Yeah. Um, with PRS, who basically are renowned for their quality and, and craftsmanship, right. you know, most so. gorgeous guitars. Yeah, there, basically, I, I agree. Something about the shape is like borderline sexual. Right. Know? No, I always like. I saw during the nineties. I saw people playing like a custom twenty four or something yeah. like that. I was like, okay, that's a real guitar player up there yeah. playing. <laughs> <laughs> that's really, doesn't matter what he sounds like. But it's funny because I told you this later uh, earlier that. Uh, 
I played the, your PRS and it feels a lot shreddier mm. than the rest of them. Yeah. Because I never gelled with PRS, like if I tried someone else's model or a custom. Like I yeah. love how they look. The fitting is fucking perfect. And you know, everything's just so good with yeah. the guitars. They're, they're immaculate, I must say. You, man. But at the same time, the neck, I just can't. But your guitars, they feel like it's meant to shred on, you know? Yeah. And, and it, it feel, did you talk, like, uh, did you specifically ask for thinner necks or? Absolutely, and and like the thinner necks, one thing, um, you probably, like I know you're an 80s shredder guy, mm -hmm. 80s, 90s metal guy like myself, and I remember growing up always going for the shredder guitar. Yeah. Like always going for, you know, the flat necks, yep. the, the long-ish uh, scale, scale length on a guitar, and just having that like, that shredder, Marty Friedman mm -hmm. feel to a guitar so I could, you know, emulate the things that I loved so much. And I always gravitated towards that. Like my first real nice guitar was a, a graduation present from my parents. Uh, it was a Jackson Rhodes RR1. Nice. Uh, with the red ghost flames. Oh shit, yeah. Yeah, and Randy Rhodes was my hero. I mean, yeah. he's, still, he's still my hero. But back then he was my favorite guitar player. I wanted the pinstripes, but they didn't have that. Like the the OG Randy yeah. Rhodes pinstripes, but uh, had that guitar. And in retrospect, there were a couple things that I learned that I loved, and then a couple that like I realized then that I wasn't a fan of Floyd's. Yeah. Like there's some, and there's people out there who make Floyd sound fucking ridiculous. I realized that I wasn't one of those people. Um, but uh, the feeling of of a 20 inch radius, like a mm. flat fretboard, yeah. and again, all these guitars have flat fretboards. Yeah. They have longer scale lengths. Uh, the neck shape is a big one. Yeah, just these these out string through bodies as well. That's another thing, yeah. like away from the trems, um, that uh, that I wanted to bring to PRS. And credit to them, like they had no real reason in the beginning to say yes. It, it was basically an openness on their part. Right. Like let's try and do something a little bit differently. Mm -hmm. You know, let's try and. I mean, sort of, it's their job to make your signature guitar too. So I mean, yeah, it's in their interest too. Right. They, they give you do what they what you want. Yeah, but back then I, I think it was very, very cool of them to sort of take this unproven commodity right. in myself and Periphery. Right. When back then, yes, it was like who gives a f about Periphery? Right, right, right. Uh, um, and 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 you know, be open to those ideas. Yeah. And so I, I just and have, also be humble that you're working with one of the biggest guitar companies in the absolutely, world. Absolutely, you know? absolutely. And one of the things that I was so taken aback with in the very beginning was that like, I expected Paul Reed Smith to like kind of run his company from a yacht somewhere oh, okay. in like the, <laughs> yeah. the Maldives or something yeah. like that and, and and not really be present in any of the conversations but he was he was battling me on things okay. like 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 binding like fret wire like right. and I just thought it was so surreal in the beginning because here was one of the most renowned sort of figureheads yep. in the music industry giving a shit about yep. all the nerdy stuff that you know keeps me awake at night so yeah, and that, that, that role on his part has never really gone away in the company. Yeah. And I think now if you take a look at PRS's evolution, um, you know, working with guys like John Mayer yeah. and, and being somehow a bigger name than they were um, when I joined, still has that same figure, yeah. like so, sort of set of responsibilities as the figurehead mm -hmm. of such a massive company. So yeah, I just have this massive respect for, for what they do. Yeah. yeah. Very cool. Well, congratulations. I like I said, I see him everywhere. Kids are playing him, and uh, it's great. Yeah, it's it's that's that's fucking surreal too. Is the fact that so many people <laughs> like the same stuff that I like. I mean, and, you know the feeling. Yeah, yeah it's, it's wild. Absolutely. Yeah. And I also you know, one thing. I I don't know when it was that you guys like decided to go for different uh, guitar brands, but I always remember like Fuck, they're so smart. Like there are three guitar players in the band. Jacobs with Ibanez, Sandra yeah. Mall. You're with PRS, Saint Germain, and you know Misha with Jackson and Saint Germain. I'm like, it's the it's the smartest thing ever. If I had so many guitar players in my band, I would do the exact thing. You know. Well, dude, I think you're giving us too much credit because I would like to be like, yeah, you're we're oh, yeah, smart we took guys. That so we can have different market uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah. outlets or whatever. I would like to say that that's true, <laughs> and I would like to say that we are smart people, but uh, <laughs> we are not. Um, no, it was it was totally a coincidence. Mm. Like, and uh, it was funny. Like when I first met Misha and Jake. Mm -hmm in the late 2000s, I, I was playing comparison guitars. Right. And the reason, so those are great guitars, mm -hmm. but I played the Angelus model because yep. it reminded me of PRSs and mm -hmm. I couldn't afford the PRSs that I wanted at the time. But it's not that comparison are necessarily cheap either. They're not, <laughs> they're, they're not, but I found a good deal on okay. Angelus, yeah, um, in Washington DC that someone sold me at a good price. But I realized like when I met them, 
that we all had pretty different tastes in guitars. Yeah, okay. Baby Mark, Baby Misha, and Baby Jake. Right. We all, like, I like that style of guitar. Jake liked, you know, the very, he still likes Ibanez. He's still, he's been playing Ibanez for like 30 years. Yeah. And then Misha had his own flavor in terms of what he liked. And that was just kind of how we went from there. Okay. And then now, if you pick up one of Jake's guitars, mm -hmm. one of my guitars, one of Misha's, they all kind of play in the same neighborhood. Okay. So it's like aesthetically we like different things, yeah. but we all have a flat fretboard. We all have a longer scale length. We right. all have necks that are like sort of shredder, 80s friendly, um, allow you to play quickly if you, if you want to. So yeah, for, for as much as we are different aesthetically in terms of what we like, like the guitars play pretty similarly. Yeah. But That's cool. Thank you. That well, was I, thought, cool. I, thought, I thought that was just the smartest uh, marketing thing ever. Yeah. Uh, but apparently it was not. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, I would like to take credit for that. What's yeah. the scale length of this 8, for instance? This is, so this is a shorter scale length for an 8. I think it's 26 and a half or oh, 27. Shit, okay. I yeah. can't remember. I, I remember it feeling different than other 8s I had played at the time. I think I had two Mayonis 8 strings right. and an Aristides 8 string. And they're like Back 27 the or... Those, yeah. those are 27, yeah. And this was a half inch shorter, so mm -hmm. I think this is 26 and a half. For us, it's perfect because we only ever play in standard eight string tuning. Right. Um, if I were to drop it down, which we've done for a periphery song before, a song called Hell Below, we dropped this eight string right. way down. But uh, yeah, I wouldn't really play it for that kind of tuning, you know? No. But for a, for a standard eight string tuning, it's perfect, yeah. Very cool. Yeah. I want to leave this subject a little bit because uh, I want to talk a little bit about video games, <laughs> if that's okay. Yeah. I wanted to ask you, because you've been voice acting for a video game, mm. or two even now. A couple, yeah, I think I'm, in total I've done three or four. Yeah, yeah. The, the most, the biggest of which was uh, a game called Disco Elysium that right. came out yeah, right. a couple years ago. That must be so cool. It's cool, and I don't even know <laughs> if I'm good at voice acting, but it was an opportunity that I thought was a joke at first. Okay. When it was pitched to me, I was like, you're f***ing with me, right? Are there cameras here filming my reaction <laughs> to this? Like, what, is someone pranking me? Is Ashton Kutcher back there somewhere waiting for me? Do you know the band Sixth? Yes, absolutely. So we were touring with the band Sixth, and Mikey, their singer, he's a very good voice actor in his own right. Okay. Like, he does all the spoken word stuff all on, right, on okay. Sixth Records. And uh, he was casting director for that game, this Disco Elysium, when it was in its early stages of development. Right. And we were on tour, and he asked me, he was like, you ever do voice acting? I'm like, no. He, he's like, well, you have a, a voice that's kind of in line with what I may be looking for. Do you want to audition? And I was like, all right, fine. Well, that's cool. Let's see how this goes. So I auditioned for two roles, and I got both of them. Damn. And yeah, it was very like different, like voice uh, voices too, or yeah, one was uh, one was some variation of my normal voice. Yeah. And the other one was, uh, I did like a, like a Latino accent. Like, oh, shit, like yeah. A, yeah. I used to live in Spain and I, I used to kind of just for fun imitate the Spanish accent right. speaking English. So. Do you know Spanish? Uh, it's workable. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. I, it's workable. Yeah. Yeah. But I, conversational. I can order stuff at restaurants. And right. Yeah. I, when I spend a lot of time in Spain, which uh, we go back to Spain pretty often, I, I, can, I can get to a place where I feel comfortable. How's your Spanish? Uh, it's okay. I did read during school, but okay. it was a... Uh, 50% absence or yeah. something like that. Okay. So it, it's it's passable. Like passable. I understand it. I can make fun of it and use, you know, I can ca carry a conversation in a right. funny manner, but that's yeah, it. Yeah, 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 yeah. Well, Should we speak a little Spanish? Vale, bien. Oh. Okay. okay. Uh, de, de qué hablamos? Trabajo. Trabajo. Como que, por ejemplo... Uh, no sé. No sé. La, las guitarras... Ocho cuerdas. P R S. P. <laughs> Paul Reed Smith. Paul uh, Reed Smith. Paul Reed Smith. Yeah. Are we racially appropriating? Oh right? yeah, probably. <laughs> probably. Dangerous grounds, right Dangerous. here. All right. You also did a, a newer game after that, so yeah, you got more jobs basically. Yeah, I got a couple more jobs, and it, it, it was um, it was a lot of it was a lot of fun, and it was one of those things again where. Like, I don't know if it's uh, if it's ever something I do full time, but as in a moonlighting regard, like yeah. it's just fun for me to have a foot in gaming, which is yeah. like, we've talked about this before, but like that was one of my first loves. Like video games was my very first love before music. What's your first game that you really, like that was emotionally your game? This is a weird answer. So there was a game on NES called Maniac Mansion. Yes, you absolutely. Ever, yeah. You played yeah, that sure. game, really? Yeah. Yeah. LucasArts? Yeah. LucasArts, yeah. yeah. It, it's kind of a, a point-and-click game, 
Um, but basically, there were there were a bunch of ways to solve the puzzle of beating this game. Yeah. And I still will fucking play this game. Um, it's incredible. But the first game that I did you play Day of the Tentacle? Later. Oh, that's the that's the continuation. Oh my Mansion. god, I never played that. Oh, is it is it good too? Yeah, yeah, that's like an early '90s game. Oh. It's available on iPhone. Really? Yes, it's really good. Yeah. I mean, do, you know, Monkey Island. And yeah, like yeah, yeah. It's the same. It's Lucas Arts. Oh man. Okay, I gotta play the second one. Then. Yeah. So that's Shit. also Manic Mansion, like the yeah. the continuation yeah, yeah, and the yeah. same characters. Yeah. Wow. What's the first game you ever uh, got emotional to? Like that ever made you want to cry? You don't have to actually say that you I cried. think it actually was Final Fantasy VII. I was about to say the same thing. Yeah, yeah. Because uh, before that, I was playing, you know, Mario 64 and yeah. Cell, like uh, Ocarina of Time. Oh, Probably yeah. oh, very, yeah. uh, very important to me. But I think Final Fantasy VII hit it on another level. Right. I never played another game that killed someone very, very essential to the plot so yes. early in a game. Like the Game of Thrones did 30 years before Game <laughs> yes. of Thrones. But your favorite was the 10th. The X. It's a tie between 7 and 10. I also fucking love 12. Mm. And 8's good too. And I know modern Final Fantasies get a lot of hate, but I actually like I actually like the newer Final right. Fantasies. They're, they're fun. Yeah, I played them. They're good. You, you don't have the time to play them, probably. No, the last one I played was X, actually. Oh, okay, okay. Did you, do you like that one? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Good ending. Very sad story. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. You know there's reaction videos of people watching the end of Final Fantasy X. And like crying. <laughs> <laughs> there was this boss, uh, Lady Unalesca. Okay. Do you remember? No, Lady? I don't remember shit. Um, so she was the second to last boss, and she cast this spell called uh, Mega Death. Oh shit! Yeah. <sighs> so it was like in her third or fourth form, and you've been fighting the battle for like thirty minutes or right. something like that, and she casts this spell called Mega Death. Like I think it's spelled differently than the band name, but still, it's a cool name for a spell that kills your whole party. Yeah. Unless one of you is cursed, so oh, you, shit. cursed or or poisoned or something like that. Basically, you, you have, have status. Yeah, you have to have the negative status mm -hmm. to survive the spell, which is fucking bullshit. Um, because instantly, you know, that game teaches you how, like, if you get a status effect, you have to cure it immediately. Yeah, otherwise, you're gonna be screwed. Yeah. And then it flips it on its head later in the game, which yeah. I thought that was the cruelest. Thing. And I still think that's one of the biggest pain in the ass moments in any Final Fantasy game. Yeah, but go back and yeah, maybe you can. I'm like, not gonna go back. <laughs> don't <laughs> go back. Yeah. I'm not gonna go back. <laughs> Just YouTube it and like yeah, go look how much of a pain in the ass that was. So, what, are you playing anything nowadays? So what was the last thing? So dude, I'm really addicted to Vampire Survivors. I, oh shit, yeah, yeah, great, game. great <laughs> yeah. game. Yeah, yeah, but you're also like a you're a Soulsborne guy too, dude. I platinumed every. Soulsborne. I saw that picture. Yeah, Sekiro too. Sekiro too. Yeah. Impressive, oh. because I love those games too. Yeah. I platinum a couple. Yeah. Uh, which one is your favorite, though? I mean, I, I may have to say Elden Ring. Like, I just think Elden Ring took all of the the, the quality of life yeah. stuff and the things they've learned mm -hmm. from like Dark Souls, which Dark Souls One is my probably my second favorite. Yeah. But like, it's easy to take a look at the most pain in the ass bullshit things about Dark Souls One, mm -hmm. and then compare them directly to Elden Ring and they just learned so many design yeah. concepts that they applied in the best way possible right. from their old game. So, uh, so yeah, I, I would have to say Elden Ring. How about yeah. yours? I'm playing Elden Ring for the fifth time right now because there's a DLC coming in February. In so, February? Yes. So I'm kind of like warming up the, uh, you know, oh. in, in that, but my favorite one is actually Demon's Souls because I played it when oh. it came out on PlayStation, the first one. And it's so fucking difficult. Right. And I got it on Halloween, so during Halloween week it was even harder because they, they nerfed it. Because that's what they did back in the day. If, if you mm. went to a certain, like, uh, they had like a time during Christmas where everything was just twice as hard. Yeah, yeah. And you would earn more, uh, you know, ex experience or whatever. Yeah, so yeah. I played a game on Halloween and it was super hard because yep. there wasn't this double, right, <laughs> like, difficulty right. thing. And I was like, what the f is this game? <laughs> Like, what the hell? I can't even, like, finish the first boss. But then uh, I got to play the, the new Demon Souls for PlayStation. Incredible, it's like right? it's, Yeah, absolutely. Incredible. So, um, I think, though, that Sekiro, Sekiro or Blood... I mean, that's the thing. I There's really so love the aesthetics of Bloodborne. Yeah. And, uh, but the action of Sekiro is probably my favorite. Dude, I found Sekiro to be the hardest one. It's definitely the hardest yeah. one. Yeah. Like, unforgiving. Yeah. Um, at least in the other games, you can grind if you're stuck. Like, people yeah. always, like... I remember Misha 
just got into Elden Ring recently. Yeah. And he would always tell me, he'd be like, where do I even start? Like, yeah. it's just so hard. Yeah. I'd be like, dude, it's not that hard. It's yeah. actually not that hard for any people who are on the fence with playing these games. It's like, if you're, if you're intimidated at the difficulty scale, scaling or anything like that, just grind. Yeah. Just exactly. grind. Exactly. That's all you got to do. And but you, Sekiro. No. No. That. You have to learn the system. Yeah. You have to block. You have to, yeah. like, you have to time blocks. Right. And keep calm. Right. Keep and calm. It, it's, uh, yeah, it's. Yeah. Menacing. I have a trick for those games. Is just mute your television. Okay. So don't no, no sound. Remove all the theatrics. Oh, remove shit. all the spectacles. All of the bombastic noise and the music, and just play and like feel it rhythmically. That's how I do it. And put on some sugar, and just uh, and just parry L one or whatever the parry button is. Yeah. 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 That was also the trick. Just push on like, like <laughs> right. this on right. Sekiro, so you could you know catch it maybe. Yeah. I I hope. So you brought up the Demon Souls remake. Yep. I fucking hope this is like my biggest wish of all time. They give the same like I think Blue Point was the studio yep. that did for Demon's Souls. Yeah, for Dark Souls One. Or if they do that for Bloodborne. Okay. Yeah. Oh my God! It doesn't have to be now, but just like at some point, like twenty twenty six. I mean, if they just release it for PC, so you could get like sixty frames per second, yeah. would be nice. <laughs> uh, I know, I know, I know. But I wouldn't mind having like a real remake of Dark Souls One, because because oh, yeah. of the level. Yeah. Design and all that. It's right. Just so that's so that, good. That's why it's my second favorite. Yeah. Right. Right behind Elden Ring is the mm -hmm. level design. Yeah. It's like that feeling of realizing that this whole pain in the ass area like connects back mm -hmm. to the first area that you saw in the game yeah. is like it's like porn. Yeah. It's like goosebumps yeah. plus porn plus every drug inject it. Give it to me. Yeah. Oh, we don't talk about drugs we here. We're in Sweden. Drugs. Yeah, yeah. It's illegal. I get. <laughs> death penalty dude thank you so much Mark dude. it's been an absolute pleasure yeah, man. Uh, do you want to sign off with a cool riff Ooh. I mean you are a guitar player <laughs> gonna put you on the spot what if I what if I pick up uh, a guitar that hasn't been tuned uh, in four days do you want to just hear what it sounds like yeah sure this is always a fun surprise I mean isn't that the trick really you just open up your tour case and you haven't touched the guitars for like a year yeah. or so and then you're yeah. like okay let's go on tour <laughs> right. not even like save strings as, as the last gig yeah so this is a fun experiment so I got on the plane in Austin Texas and two and a half days later here I am in Stockholm Sweden and I I, I haven't tuned this thing I haven't even touched this since I got off uh, since I got onto the plane and we're just gonna see what it sounds like all right, so I have to play Oasis <laughs> in the tuning. One fret up. Beautiful. That, that's amazing. That's great. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. It's a great way of ending it all. You know? Wait, let me see what... Actually, it's not... That's wow. not too bad. It's not bad Just at all. push a little less. Yeah. That's how you to go Yeah. <laughs> Like what? What's the string gauge for? Is this drop C now or what is it? Uh, this is drop C. Yes. Yeah, so yeah. what string gauge are you using for that? I, oh man, I just have uh, it's a Horizon string set I have on here. Oh, okay. Forget which set I have. I'm pretty sure it's just the, the Misha set that he gave okay. me the setup. Yeah, he's the last couple of tours. He's been giving me his string gauge sets, and I, I just use whatever he's got there. So apologies, I don't know, the, but just you know, Google whatever the gauges right. are, and then. Uh, in that set but no, it looked like you had like a lot of uh range to to bend like on the the a string right there yeah i was just thinking like maybe a little bit thinner i have a riff okay since we were talking about yes. this band <laughs> yes. Yeah, nice. Yeah, that's perfect. Yeah, Thank man. you so much for Thanks that. Thanks for having me. Yeah, <laughs> awesome. Yeah. Dude, fuck, man. That was good. Yeah, that was fun. Fun.